Twilight Syndrome. It's an incredibly intriguing series of games that stars young high schoolers as they investigate rumors of paranormal phenomenon like young people do in real life, and the rumors are often based on real life urban legends. And to make things really interesting, the cases that these young people investigate often somehow make them realize things about themselves or involve themselves in some kind of way. And these games are incredibly well told stories that unlike a lot of other horror games, really nail tension. These games can build up to a confrontation like it's nobody's business, to the point that there's rarely, if, any, if ever, any actual supernatural phenomenon appearing on screen. But you feel it, you are right there with the people investigating. And as they get more and more tense, so do you. And that's an incredible feat for games that are just glorified walking simulators. And just experiencing them is an event and an incredibly immersive one. I've previously explained the plot of the first game, and if you haven't watched that yet, please go do that, as the sequel picks up seconds after the ending of the first game. But if you have watched that first series, then please sit back and relax, and let me for probably the first time in English, take you on a journey through Twilight Syndrome Kiyomi Hen, aka Investigation. After Mika vanishes into thin air, Yukari and Chisato heads back to the library to see if they can figure out how to get to where Mika is. And through their research and with a little help from a teacher, they learn of a portal to enter the Hanashiro Grove. And they make their way to the portal and they enter. And they find themselves in some kind of strange forest that feels strangely old. And they begin to wander around and look for any signs of where Mika could be. Chisato and Yukari come across a shrine and realize it is an important one. Chisato convinces Yukari to go inside and here they find Sakura's journal and learn that the strange way that she referred to her mother and her sister dying was suicide and that it was kind of like a ritualistic suicide as they were as she is, maidens of Hanashiro. The story goes that a young girl was sacrificed so that another girl could be cured of her illness. But the sacrificed girl tainted the river and so a tradition was started where women of a certain bloodline would be sacrificed when they came of age to reverse the taint. A ritual sacrifice to stave off the destruction brought upon by a ritual sacrifice. As the girls conclude their reading, they see Sakura and Mika through the window in the shrine. They yell out to Mika and she hears them and tells Sakura that she has to go. The window they see through isn't a window really, it's more like a portal and Mika isn't on the other side but somewhere else, but they do have some sort of power to read through and at least communicate with her. Sakura tries to convince Mika to stay and says that if she leaves, the spirits and the river will be angry. Yukari begins yelling at Mika and realizes that pleading doesn't work. She has to be her authentic Yukari self and she yells to Mika that she has to come back or she won't ever get to hang out with him again. Which does seem to work as Mika begins to respond to Yukari. Yukari's yelling manages to get through to Sakura as well and in the end she's the one that actually convinces Mika to leave as she realizes that she loot her here because she was lonely, not for Mika's sake as she originally convinced herself. Because Mika came here of her own free will and that Sakura learned to let go of her, she and the other maidens are allowed to pass on, and as they do, the grove collapses and the humans present, Mika, Chisato and Yukari, find themselves back at the shrine on the mountain in the real world. Mika. 
Some time after, Chisato and Yukari are discussing Mika and how weird it is that she seems to be back to normal. Mika walks up to them and it's obvious that she has a rumor she wants to investigate and the others can't quite wrap their head around her wanting to do that again also quickly after that last thing. Mika asks if Yukari is reluctant because she's worried about her, which flusters Yukari and she and Shisato then walks away. Mika remains for just a moment and hears a voice in the wind say her name and then farewell. Kitamura is breaking up with Yukari and he's blaming it on the situation with the music teacher and his student that we investigated in the second rumor in the first game. He says that it's not forever, only until they no longer have to pretend. Ew. Meanwhile, two people are discussing a recent suicide at school. The kid was bullied and went nuts and then killed himself, a kid named KT and later on at a school assembly all of the students are informed of this. Not long after, KT is spotted in the school's equipment locker and this naturally catches the attention of the Syndrome Trio, which was what Mika wanted to talk about in the previous chapter. Yukari doesn't want to investigate it out of fear of the ghost being angry, but Mika and Chisato manages to convince her anyways. <laughs> Rumor has it that he appears at dusk, so they meet back up at the school shortly before that. They get to the locker room and decide to put on gym shoes before entering, as they don't want to get in trouble should anyone see them in the gym with outdoor shoes on. As they look for shoes, one of the lockers opens up by its own, but it's nothing. Not finding any ghosts in the gym itself, they make their way towards the equipment locker and on their way there, they do see something weird just before they enter and inside they see him in the dusk glow of a window. Yukari doesn't know how to talk to a ghost, so she has Mika ask him if he's KT, and she does, and then he just disappeared. And the trio decides to call it a night. The next day they meet up between periods and talk about what just happened. KT was apparently bullied by primarily two students, who both beat him and extorted him for money. Yukari doesn't think that that's a fucked up enough reason for anyone to turn into a ghost, so she thinks they should investigate and they go around school and ask people about KT and the bullies and the incidents. One girl explains that he didn't seem to mind getting beaten up, like it didn't bother him. Another says that the two primary bullies treated him like a slave, but that he just laughed at it, like he seemed to enjoy it. And another boy doesn't understand how he even killed himself when he seemed so lifeless to begin with, and like Yukari, doesn't understand why he turned into a ghost either. With no other leads, they confront one of the bullies, but he denies everything, which doesn't help them at all. Having become none the wiser, they decide to go and head back to the gym at dusk and talk to KT and see if he will communicate with them this time. On the way to the equipment room, they spot a ball, but when they try and pick it up and put it back in its place, it just rolls away. They attempt to contact KT again, and the whole room begins to shake, and then he appears, and this time, he does talk. The girls introduce themselves, and KT apparently recognizes Mika. They ask him why he's here as a ghost, and he's very confused and doesn't seem to realize that he was one up until now, and they follow up by asking him if he's holding a grudge, which makes him very angry. He's only wearing a single gym shoe, and they ask him about that, and he responds that he lost it. They ask about his bullying, and he says that he gets along with the bullies fine, and is very insistent about it before fading away again. Chisato believes that they are a little responsible for not trying to help him while he was alive, but Yukari doesn't agree, and thinks that they should ne never have gotten involved in the first place. Sometimes later, we hear someone playing ball in a gym, and then a lamp falls down, and a scream is heard. Mikai calls up Yukari and tells her that it was one of the bullies, and that he got hurt really badly. 
not buying the whole official explanation that it was just metal fatigue that made the lamp fall down, and not wanting to wait for anyone else to get hurt, including themselves, if he manages to make it that far down his revenge list, the girls go and confront KT again. First, Mika is sent off to the hospital to ask the victim what happened, as the bully that got hurt happens to have a crush on her, like a lot of boys do at the school. The bully Kurata initially plays dumb about the whole ghost thing, but Mika tricks him into saying his name, confirming that he knows who he is, and accidentally alluding to the fact that he saw him when the lamp fell, or at least that he felt him like he was haunting the gym. Kurata insists that he and Saeki, the other bully, were friends with KT and says that if Mika doesn't believe him, she can just go ask KT's parents as the three of them had sleepovers over there. When Mika is telling the rest of the group what happened, Chisato suggests that they go talk to the parents just to see if they were actually friends in some kind of like perverse way. The mother is very angry at the school and doesn't understand how they would let the bullying go so far. She does confirm that the bullies did spend time at the house and that KT called them friends, and she didn't notice any bullying from the two of them. She blames the school for not noticing the same thing that she also didn't notice, because she doesn't want to. She doesn't want to admit that her son was being bullied, and like everyone else, she pretended not to notice, just like the bullies, just like KT himself. Yukari makes that point, and it leaves the mother absolutely speechless. She then feebly attempts to defend herself before giving up and just telling the trio to leave. Yukari wants nothing to do more with the case and says that she is out because she doesn't want to end up like Kurata. Chisato responds that she doesn't understand because she's too strong of a person. She could never understand how someone could be trapped like that, how someone could try and try and escape such a situation but fail every time because they just aren't strong enough to separate themselves from things that hurt them because it also brings them a little joy, and they rather live with a lot of hurt and a little love than none of either. Yukari doesn't understand this because she has never been in that situation and she never will. She will never allow anything like that to happen to her. Jisato and Mika then go alone to the equipment room one more time in one final attempt to calm the spirit down. He doesn't appear though when they call him, but as they are about to give up and are about to leave, he finally does. They ask about the accident, but KT denies that it was him. They keep pushing and pushing and he keeps denying and denying, but gets more and more angry before finally, unlike during his lifetime, he finally accepts the truth and his own small complicity in what happened to him. The mental contact with the ghostly KT triggers something in Chisato, and she gets a vision, a flashback of what happened, and we learn that there was a third bully, a ringleader. And during the events leading up to the suicide, KT was supposed to bring him money so that they could all go show some girls from a rival high school a very good time, but he didn't bring it. He didn't want to party right before a big basketball match, as he really loved basketball. The bullies didn't take this kindly, and they beat him very badly and taunted him, telling him to kill himself, telling them that he was worthless, and that he had to come up with the money so that they could all show the girls from that other high school a really good time, or else. Chisato now understands, and despite being weak from receiving the vision she just received, she decides to go back one final time and get the full truth. Yukari confronts Seiki, one of the bullies, about the whole thing, and informs him that she know they pretended to be KT's friends so that they could extort money from him and what they did in that equipment room. Yukari keeps tearing into Seiki until he finally caves and admits that he feels guilty, admits that he know he was a shithead, admits that he in his own twisted way appreciated KT. The Syndrome Trio decides to confront KT in the gym for a final time and plead with him to tell them the truth, even though it might be painful to admit. He finally caves and says that he doesn't understand why they do it, why they hurt others and extort money from them, and then he just asks for his other gym shoe. He finally understands how bad his life was and then he just fades away. The trio go looking for the gym shoe knowing that it will finally put him back to rest for good, 
They find it outside and return the shoot to the locker that opened by itself in the beginning of the search, not really knowing what else to do. Following the events, Chisato took a break from school for just a little while, and when she did return, she acted like nothing had happened, just like Mika. KT's parents decided to sue the school, and the school started an investigation. The bullies confessed their wrongdoing, and the hungry tabloids and even the school itself was almost disappointed that the events that led to his suicide weren't more dramatic than bullying and a lack of intervening. A phone rings and Yukari answers. The call on the other side is unknown, and they keep repeating, Hello. Yukari tries to inform whoever it is that calls that they just keep saying hello, and then she hangs up and curses whoever is prank calling her. <laughs> The next day at school she's talking to the others about the call, and Chisato asks if it happened at midnight, and it did. According to Mika, a phone call at midnight is the dead trying to get in contact with a person, and that the person that is getting called should not be the one to hang up, and that the spirit has a request that should be fulfilled. Chisato confirms that it's a common held belief, and says that she'll look into it and tells Yukari to not pick up the phone again. Later, when Yukari is home and turns on some music, the music starts to act funky after a while, and Yukari begins fiddling with the boombox it's playing from, and notices that the time is showing midnight. Thinking that the boombox just got the time wrong, she goes to check her clock and it's also showing midnight, and she thinks that the clock is also wrong. She calls Chisato, but she's not there, and instead her mother answers the phone, and tells Yukari that Chisato had a message and that the message was to not answer the phone, and that she will call when she is done investigating something at her grandfather's place. She calls a number that tells the time and learns that the time is 6.15pm and not midnight. She corrects the time on her boot box to be 6.15 and then her clock as well, but sets it 5 minutes forward so that she will have more time when she gets up in the morning. As she does this, the phone rings. And it's someone asking for someone that is not Yukari. Yukari informs them that they have the wrong number, and a whole group of girls can be heard laughing, and then they hang up. Someone calls again and says that they were supposed to make a delivery earlier, but that no one was home, and ask if they can deliver it 15 minutes from now, to which Yukari agrees. A little while later, Yukari doesn't understand why the delivery man is not here yet, and goes to check her clock on the boombox, and finds that it stopped again, before she can make much of it. The phone rings again. And this time, it's Chisato. She tells Yukari that the rumor of the dead contact in the living is true, and that it has been going on since way before phones, and used to happen via letters. Chisato says that the person probably wants to take Yukari with them, to which Yukari assures Chisato it will just not happen. Chisato says that she's gonna go do more research and will get back to her, but wants her to not answer any phone call that she feels 
weird about. Yukari gets back to the boombox clock issue and calls the time number again to get the time and the number informs her that it's now midnight. Figuring that the time service is broken as well, Yukari decides not to do anything about any of it. The phone rings again, and Yukari picks it up, and a man laughs maniacally on the other end before hanging up. Yukari senses that something strange is going on, and she calls Aramata, the strange man that Mika has been able to call throughout the last game, who I cut from the previous video about the game because he was irrelevant to the plot and only served to provide hints about the current investigations. Aramata has heard of Yukari before and is pleased to hear from her. She asks about the phone calls from Z and if they exist, but Aramata is not familiar with this specific phone call thing, but has heard of the letters from the dead. He says that because Yukari picked up the phone, she might have opened a door to the spirit realm and that she could be getting calls from all kinds of people from the other side and then the phone call with Aramata cuts out. Yukari freaks out over this and tries to call the emergency services, but someone on the other end named Alice picks up the phone and says that she can never come home and that the king got a riddle wrong and off went the heads. The call cuts out and Yukari tries to call the police next, but just like before, the person on the other end is not the person that was supposed to be answering, but instead a voice on the other end that recites poetry. The call cuts out and she tries to call emergency services again, and on the other end she reaches a voice recording informing her that she is calling outside business hours, which is weird because emergency services obviously doesn't have outside business hours. She gives up on trying to call anyone, and then the phone calls her, and it's the delivery guy again. Yukari asks where he went and he says that he went by but that no one was here and that he's gonna try and deliver it tomorrow. She hangs up and can't quite wrap her head around what just happened and then the phone rings again, but when she answers there's just nothing on the other end. The phone rings again and this time it's Chisato. She asks if anything is up and Yukari explains all the strange calls that she's been getting. Jisato says that she's found something and that Yukari needs to keep picking up the phone so that she can get the message from whoever wanted to contact her in the first place or else they'll just show up at her house and take her with them. The person calling is someone from Yukari's past and she needs to figure out who it is and what they want so that she can answer their question and make them stop and give them rest. She searches her room and finds an album that reminds her of her childhood before she can figure it out. Her mother calls and tells her that one of her relatives has passed away, a girl her own age. Yukari is suddenly reminded of her and how she was sick and how they used to spend a lot of time together when the girl, Sachiko, was in hospital. She gets off the phone with her mother and then someone calls and she picks up the phone and it's the ghost voice from the beginning, continuously going hello, hello, hello. Yukari asks if it's Sachiko and the voice responds that it is and that she died and that she's sorry that she can't fulfill her promise. Yukari says that it's fine and that she doesn't need to worry about it and Sachiko says that she has to go and says goodbye and then the call cuts out. The trio are at karaoke. Mika has brought them here and apparently not just to sing, but that is what they'll do for now. 
while Mika sings. Shisato asks Yukari about the whole teacher thing and if it's over. Yukari is obviously surprised that she knew but says that it's gone and done. And then it's her turn in the karaoke machine and she gets up and sings Nirvana, allegedly. While Shisato sings what is essentially the Japanese version of oldies, Mika tells Yukari about a nearby apparent haunting at a construction site, the site that we briefly saw in the opening of the game. They were supposed to build a new mall there, but bones were found and the construction was halted. Yukari interjects that the construction could have also halted because of the economic bubble bursting, which happened a few years ago prior to the game. Mika believes the construction site might be the ruins of an old abandoned castle that was supposed to have been around here. Shisato, while initially reluctant to partake in the karaoke, is now wanting to stay, so Mika and Yukari go ahead without her. The gate to the site is locked, but they find a way in through a less secure one. They come across a hatch in the ground, and with their combined efforts they manage to get it open. And to let Shisato know where they are going, they tie a stuffed animal to the rung of the ladder so that she will know where they are, and then they descend into the hole. Inside there is a path and they start walking along it and head into a room and inside the room find a radio, which Mika fiddles around with and she manages to pick up a faint signal of something. They figure that it belongs to someone and that someone is here and they go back out into the hallway where the path was and continue their search for... something. Yukari trips on a set of stairs that she didn't notice, but when she looks up after her fall, She's completely alone and in pitch black darkness. She crawls back to where she thinks they came from, but no one is here and she sees a light coming from the other direction and decides to head towards that. She enters a side room and it seems to be a meeting room of some sort and she recognizes some propaganda posters as being from the war, which has to be the second world war. Wandering around some more, she sees a hallway with a light at the end of it, and then multiple figures can be seen in the distance. She tries to follow the figures and enters the room where she thinks they entered, but inside it's just empty. She does, however, see what she thinks are outlines of the people on the wall, and she seems to be hearing very faint voices. As she turns around to leave, she smells disinfectants, and then she hears someone talking about some sort of procedure or experiment. When she tries to open the door to get out, it won't budge, but then it opens and an old man appears in the doorway, wondering what she's doing here. Yukari tells him that she's lost and that she got separated from her friend, and the old man asks if the girl is wearing the same clothes as her, to which Yukari confirms, and the old man says that yeah, she's safe, which puzzles Yukari, but she nonetheless follows the man, and as they walk, he begins muttering something about air raids and communication being down and that the enemy has broken through the defense zone. Yukari asks who the enemy is and the old man says that it's America and England of course. The old man continues to talk about the war effort and how victory is just around the corner for them. Yukari is obviously confused by this because you know, Japan suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of the allied forces and that in a roundabout way led to the economic miracle that Yukari grew up in. Inside a very nicely decorated room they find Mika and the old man tells them to get some rest and that he wants to know more about what is going on on the surface outside when they are more calm. Yukari and Mika keep inquiring about the war just to make sure that the old man is talking about the second world war and he gets angry and says that if everyone was as carefree as them, Japan would lose the war against the allies. <laughs> if only he knew. Have convinced the old man is just senile, they play along and agree to stay in the room they are in, but when the man leaves, they decide that it's too weird in here, and they begin looking for a way out. During their quote-unquote escape, they hear someone coming, and they duck into a side room to hide. Their footsteps sounds like they are heading towards where they are, so they hide in a cabinet, and then the old man enters and gives his report to someone about a project being ready for deployment. The voice says that when they finally deploy the Iron Soldier and drive back the attacking army, they will finally all be able to leave. The voice inquires about the girl he saw being let into the guest room and the old man gets embarrassed like he wanted to hide Yukari and Mika and not let anyone know that they are here. 
Mika and Yukari wonder where the voice came from as no one else entered the room before the conversation began. And as the man exits and they crawl out, they see a picture on the wall of a man with the same rank as the rank the old man addressed the unnamed voice by, and they wonder if he was talking to that painting. While wandering around and looking for an exit, the old man finds them and he scolds them for running off. They say they want to go home, but he won't let them, which of course angers them, and they start shouting at him that the war is over and that it's been over for a very long time since before either of them were born, and tell him the Allies won and that Japan lost, and that there is no reason for whatever they are building here to be deployed, and that they can all go home. But because they've learned of a secret project, the old man won't let them leave and he subdues them. Meanwhile, Chisato has finished her karaoke and heads towards the construction site to meet up with Yukari and Mika, but stops by the nearest payphone and calls Yukari's mother to check if they already went home. Her mother responds that she is not home yet, so Chisato enters the construction site and finds the stuffed toy they left behind to show her the way. She does get a very bad vibe from the hatch, but decides to enter it anyways, as she wants to make sure that nothing has happened to Mika and Yukari. While she searches for them, she comes across an injured soldier who asks her for water. He is complaining that his lungs are burning and that the enemy set fire to the city. Chisato knows that he's not of this world, but she nonetheless goes to fetch him water from a world she saw earlier, and to her surprise, he is still there when she comes back with the water. She asks about her friends, and the soldier tells her that he saw them and gives her a key to get into the barracks. The soldier says he has no need for the keys anyway, and then he just fades away. Meanwhile, Mika and Yukari wake up back in the nice guest room, and Mika gets ready to jump the old man should he come into the room again. She hears someone come in, and she doesn't do anything. The old man enters the room, and he apologizes for sedating them, but says that what he's doing, what they are doing, it's very important. They plead with him to let them leave, but he won't hear anything of it or allow them to use a phone, because there is none down here. The man leaves them in the room, and they start arguing, Yukari of course blaming Mika for dragging her into all of this. They hear someone approaching again, and figures that it's the old man and plans to knock him out, but it's Chisato. She tells them the story of the soldier, and asks if she's seen the old man, and explain what he did to them. She hasn't, but says that they have to leave, because this place, it's full of bad energy, and then they all start to make their escape. During the escape, they once again hear the Major and the old man yelling at each other, and they stick around and listen to their conversation. The Major is very upset that the old man let the girls in, but the old man insisted he had to because of the air raids. The girls work up the courage, and they enter the room and see that the old man is indeed completely alone. They try and reason with him, but he won't hear it and when they attempt to leave, he follows them, brandishing a weapon. After their attempt to calm him down fail, they then go into a full sprint and they run away, and they come across a big door and they fumble with the keys before they find the right one, and then they enter the room beyond it. The old man comes barreling towards them and they slam the door on him and lock it, and then make their way through a corridor and enter a large room that looks like some kind of ritualistic site. There is a pentagram in the middle, and the whole room is illuminated by dozens if not hundreds of candles, and off to the side is a large coffin-like object, and inside it something resides. It is like a corpse, but it is twisted and altered. The trio come to the conclusion that this broken Frankenstein-like monster is probably the Iron Soldier, but they don't exactly think that it's gonna be this unstoppable warrior that can cross the entire army of the allied forces. While they are wondering about this, the old man appears behind them and says that now that they've seen the soldier, there is no way that he will let them go. They attempt once again to plead with him, and yell at him that the war is over and that Japan lost. He thinks they're spies, but they insist, and they question how long he's been down here, and tell him that it's been 50 years and that there are no raids on the surface anymore. The old man says that that can't be true, but he begins to question it anyways. They tell him about the atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that Japan surrendered. He knows of the bombs, and says that his sister, he lived at Hiroshima. 
The juror says that it was so long ago that they don't know how to feel about it anymore, because it was before any of them were born and they know nothing of what it was like during the war, because they didn't live through it and sometimes they wish people would stop talking about it, and other times they feel guilty for thinking something like that. The old man says that the ritual is gonna happen, but Chisato says that it doesn't matter. There is no one for the Iron Soldier to fight against. While they're all arguing, an airstrike warning is heard over the intercom system, and the old man breaks down and pleads to be free of all this. As he does, the soldier begins to shake, and then it all goes dark, and we hear the old man shout that the Iron Soldier is not supposed to move just yet, and then a screech or a roar is heard, and then a thump. The old man says that the Iron Soldier has awoken, and he tells the trio to flee. They run as the facility rumbles and crumbles around them, and it seems like it's all gonna come down any second now. They run around and get turned around, but then they bump into the old man and he points them in the right direction. Before they leave, he says that he now remembers everything, and that he died 50 years ago along with everyone else. They try and convince him that he's alive, but he insists that he's dead, and that he has been before the war ended. The way the old man pointed towards leads them to an underground river, and they jump in and let the current sweep them away. They make it outside, and in the distance down in the city, there is a plume of smoke coming from where the construction site is. Before they leave, they take a picture of the cloud for their collection of ever-growing ghost sightings. The trio look out at the landscape below and are thankful for the world they live in. Economic collapse or not. And the next day, they take a look at the picture they took, and they see that there is definitely a certain energy surrounding the plume. Mika is very impressed, but Yukari denies that it's supernatural in origin. Chisato believes that the explosion and the plume let all the lost souls that she felt down there loose and finally free after so very long. We open up to a fortune teller working her stand on the street, and then someone, who we may or may not know, walks by and chats her up. The fortune teller begins laying out tarot cards and says that they are quite different from regular tarots and are quite accurate in their prediction. The first card is picked, the great wave, a sign of an ongoing great change. The forest card is picked next, and it says that the person it is drawn for is deeply lost in an endless labyrinth looking for answers. The third card represents separation, and that the mystery person isn't completely prepared to accept the separation. The fourth card represents confusion, and confused emotions. The fifth card, deceased, they've lost someone recently, or have left something of themselves in the world of the dead. The final card is the maiden, is there a girl in her life? Or is the card referring to herself? The fortune teller tells her to go close her eyes and sense things, and the person sees a girl with bobbed hair in her mind's eye, and then the fortune teller says that she'll meet that girl again, and that it will impact her fate. Her, and only her, can decide what direction she is gonna go. As the person opens their eyes, the fortune teller is gone. <laughs> Mysteriously enough, Mika then shows up at school and asks the others to go investigate the whereabouts of a girl with bobbed hair and then gets mad at Yukari for having forgotten that case. And then she goes on to remind them all of the first rumor they investigated, the girl in the bathroom. She says they summoned her wrong and that she thought they wanted to play with her and if they do it right, she can instead grant them a wish. The others are reluctant but Mika of course manages to convince them in the end like she always does. Yukari needs to get the keys to the, uh, yeah, that might be awkward, so they are gonna have to sneak in instead. The 
they start making their way to the art room on the second floor because the window in there faces northeast which is the direction known as the demon's gate. Mika doesn't exactly have the ritual ready but instead the lyrics of a song where the words to summon the girl with the bobbed hair are hidden. She starts drawing a circle on the floor to start the summoning ritual and they all start chanting the lyrics of the song hoping that it will summon the spirit. As the chant concludes, nothing happens but apparently it's not supposed to happen here. The chant is just supposed to summon her but she will appear in the bathroom where they first met her. As they walk towards their destination, they see a light coming from where they are heading and Yukari and Shisato wants to go home but Mika, she's having none of it. As I alluded to earlier, because they don't have the keys to the school because Yukari is not, you know, doing inappropriate things with an adult human being, they have to take a little detour. Mika remembers that the lock on the fourth floor is broken so they start making their way up there, but unfortunately the lock is not broken and the door is firmly locked. As they start to walk away, they hear a noise and when they turn around there is someone there and then she disappears and then the door that was just locked, it opens, so maybe it was broken. As they enter, they notice that they are not on the fourth floor of the building but the first floor and then they start to hear a noise. Understandably freaked out but in too deep to go home, the trio starts to ascend the stairs. On the third floor, Chisato begins to send something and warns everyone to be careful. They enter a room where a sound is coming from and inside there's a big ball of pulsating light and Shisato says that it's a bad light and that it's not connected to the girl with the bobbed hair. Yukari asks Shisato what she means and Shisato wants her not to get closer or she will get sucked in but it seems that it's too late and the room gets filled with light and the sound that the ball is emitting becomes more and more intense but the girl manages to break away from its hole and run back into the hallway. They begin to question if they summoned the right spirit and Mika insists they followed the ritual correctly and then they hear that chant or rhyme that they were saying earlier somewhere in the distance coming from what seems like a little girl so they must have done something right. But it does seem that they unleashed more than just her and they contemplate asking someone for help. Mika's pager goes off and it's her old friend, the old man Aramata. He is probably their best bet so they begin making their way down to the first floor to find a phone. They head through a door that should lead them to a connecting passage like the other one they used to get in. But through the door is a rundown classroom that none of them recognize. Apparently it might be the classroom where the discs are kept from the seven mysteries rumor about that student that fell down the stairs and broke her neck. They try cutting through the pool to get to another exit but a ghost pool swimmer appears and they start to run and notice that the water in the pool is strangely bright and when they look down at it, it's just full of dead swimmers. The trio runs off but gets separated and Yukari is suddenly on her own. She begins searching for the others but also a way out and as she makes her way through a classroom, she sees a translucent girl crying and she calls out to her and asks what she's doing. She replies that this is where they always met and that they thought they would always be together and that she didn't know it would end in such a one-sided way. And, and then she repeats the last thing she thought of in life. If I died, would he be sad? And then I cut my wrists. Yukaris thinks at first that it might be MF but realizes that she didn't cut her wrist but hung herself and then Yukara realizes that it's herself from some fucked up future. The screen fades to black and Shisato and Mika are here and Yukari is on the ground being waken up by them. Yukari thinks that it was a dream but over where the ghost was the keys to the school that she usually uses are on the ground and they seem to be the very same one that she always use. They use the key to open a locked door and enter a connecting corridor but as they make their way through a whistle is heard from behind them and when they turn around there is a ghost girl. They run off and stop to collect their thoughts and they realize that this spell messed up something and opened a portal and it didn't just summon Hanako-san, it opened a door to a realm and now all kinds of spirits are pouring into their world. They have to find a phone and ask Aramata for advice and as they make their way in the direction of the phone the whole school starts to rumble and, and their noise is heard and then a bright light flashes and then nothing. They look through a window and a ghost just slams up against it forcing them to run off once again. They encounter a ghost who's begging them to let them go back and he's not referring to life, he wants to go back to the world of the dead and they suspect that they might all want that to some degree and that they are all acting out because of frustration, not because of anger. 
Yukari wants to leave, but Jisato and Mika convinces her that they have to stay, and they have to call Aramata and ask for help. Aramata says that what they did was really bad, and as Mika recites the chant, Aramata reveals that it's not the song to bring out the girl so that she can grant wishes, but an incantation that releases the dead from the world of the living, like the girls already suspected. He clarifies that it didn't just open a portal, it opened a portal that only attracts vengeful spirits that want to harm the living because the living have the one thing they don't. Life. To reverse it, they need to find the inverse of the place where they first did the summon spell and do everything opposite. Stand with their backs turned to each other and reverse the incantation to seal the portal. Mika works with Aramata to mix up the lyrics and make for the sealing incantation but the phone signal cuts out before they're completely done, so they have to figure out the final part by themselves and find the place where to do it. They realize that the most spirits they have encountered tonight have hung around exit signs or exits in the school, so they figure that the entrance to the school could be a good location to do the inverse of the summoning spell and be the reverse of the art room, which is a room that creates things. Unlike the entrance, which is a room where student souls are sucked out when they enter or something like that. They make their way there without incident and perform the ritual and the spirits all assume spectral form and fly into the air lighting up rooms here and there around the school and as they do, the entire school becomes a big ball of light and then poof, nothing. The trio are speechless for a moment and don't dare to look at the school. And when they finally do, there's just no one there. As a precaution, Shisato uses her weird powers to fill up the space and she doesn't feel any ghost presence either. After they finished the ritual, they all went home, and while successful, Yukari seemed on edge. Chisato says that she understands, but she really doesn't. The next day, they went to the place where the portal was and confirmed that it was closed. Chisato was on edge for days, keeping an eye out for ghosts and ears out for rumors, fearing that the incantation didn't quite fully work. She wonders how the spirits experienced our world, and if being a spirit is just another state of being like we've seen before. Since that night, Yukari has brooded more than usual, and Chisato wonders what happened when they were separated that night. Chisato fears that they are now somehow touched by the spirit world, and can never quite fully escape it. We see a child playing on a slide, and then we hear Yukari wondering who the child is, as she looks very familiar. She's then awoken by her mother, who asks her if something is wrong, and then Yukari says nothing but that she had a strange dream. Apparently, a girl in the neighborhood has gone missing, and she's around the same age as the one in the dream, and the police suspects that she's been kidnapped. We then see the trio looking out at a cityscape, and Mika wants to go to the beach, but Yukari doesn't want to. They ask her if she's okay, as she's been very quiet lately, and ask if it's about Chi-chan, the girl that's gone missing. Yukari tells them about the dream, and about the girl on the slide, and how Chi-chan actually disappeared from a park with a slide just like the one in her dream. She feels that the girl isn't Chi-chan but herself, or at least someone that she knows very closely from her past. Mika suggests that they go to the park and look for clues as what happened to Chi-chan, and they all agree to meet up after school, and then they go do that. Chisato and Yukari came here often as children, when they were around the same age as Chi-chan. They approached the slide where Chi Chen disappeared from. Her mother was watching her but turned around for a minute, and when she turned back, Chi Chen was gone. The slide is the same one from Yukari's dream, or it's at least the same model. Mika suggests that Yukari touch the slide to create a spiritual connection between the real world object and the dream object, and maybe that can give them some clues. Yukari doesn't see anything in her mind's eye, 
but she definitely hears a child singing faintly, but she thinks it might just be a memory of when she used to play here and not a psychic link to that of a missing child. The trio then go to the slide and slide down, and while they feel like idiots, they also think it's kind of fun and nostalgic. Chisato used to be afraid of slides because it's said that doing the same thing over and over can transport you to another world. But, you know, she's come past that fear now. They go down the slide once again to see if they pick up any psychic links, and then again, and when they slide down a third time, a loud crackle of thunder is heard. They wander around the playground some more and reminisce about their various encounters with playswing sets. There is a man just sitting on the ground at the park. He apologizes but says that the performance is over and then tells them about the performance and how the hero Red Mask defeated the monster octopus. They talk a little to the performer who does a kind of serialized play for children that they come and watch at the park every day. The gang start investigating the area around the park and they suddenly find themselves in a part of Hanashiro that they don't quite recognize and it looks very old. They approach a policeman and says that they are lost and he says that it's common and that people wander in here all the time who are lost. They ask which way Hanashiro High School is and he doesn't know, but when they ask about Chi-chan, he seems to remember her and that she headed towards the shopping district. With no other leads and not knowing where they are, they decide to head there and as they are about to leave, the policeman says something cryptic about giving themselves up to the twilight and then the city will accept them. While looking for Chi-chan, they walk past all kinds of people who look like they are all out of place and confused as to where they are and a lot of them look really strange, like they are somehow not from this time. They stumble upon a crowd watching a TV broadcast on the street. The broadcast seems to be of something that has already happened. And when they turn around to go in the direction of the shopping street, they are then stopped by an old man in a coat who is very cryptic and speaks in rhymes. He says that they are fating and that they will in time come to accept how things are around here and then he disappears in a flash of light. When the light fades, the gang are no longer in the square they were in before and Chisato theorizes that the place has shaped itself to make them feel more complacent so that they will forget who they are so that they will stay and won't attempt to leave and then just accept that this is how things are and stay forever. They walk around and look for a way out and eventually ask a worker, but he's just as confused as they are and searching for the same thing. Yukari feels that something is wrong and she asks Mika and Chisato if they can remember what one of their teachers looked like and they can't. And Yukari feels like there are other things that she suddenly can't remember and there are probably other things that she doesn't even remember that she doesn't even remember. They chat up an old woman who's not lost like the others but who looks like she lives here and she apparently knows the town. She says that if they keep wandering it will all make sense at some point and tells them to just enjoy the twilight. They make a loop around town and they start talking to the people that they have already talked to before and they learn that the old woman was correct, they more they walk around the more complacent they become, like the other people around here. And they can slowly feel themselves beginning to accept that this is just how things are. They return to the old woman and ask exactly what just this place is. And she says that it's Higan, a town between the world of the living and the world of the dead, where sad spirits are nursed for a while before they pass on. Since the trio isn't dead, they want to leave and tell the woman that they are not dead and she says that's a lie, because the living cannot enter this place. The woman says that the only way out of town is the bridge that takes the spirits to the other side. And while they're talking, another crackle of thunder is heard and then a blinding light envelops them. And they are no longer where they were just a moment ago. They approach an old man who is happy to finally be crossing the bridge and as she vanishes, 
They then notice a faint church organ playing in the distance and head to the nearby church and enter it, and they all cram into the confessional booth and confess that they are not here to confess but to ask a question, and their question is, how do they crush the bridge without crushing into the afterlife? Following a brief silence, a voice from the other side replies that they don't know. The priest says that if they are alive and if they are here where they shouldn't be, then there must be a reason for it. He theorizes that someone who has before been close to the world of the dead could somehow slide into this place and asks if one of them is and then asks how they got here and they tell him about going down the slide multiple times and then about the distant thunder. The priest says that because children are so close to death, they can maybe also cross over and that because Yukari has a close connection to the child that they are looking for, they were able to follow her. He specifies that it doesn't have a, to be a close personal connection to the child itself, but that the child can remind a person of something about themselves. Outside the church, they all try to remember details about their lives, but can't remember what the faces of their close relatives look like anymore. As they continue looking for a way out, a glow comes over them and it becomes so intense that it blocks out everything else. As it passes, they find that they are no longer in the old twilight town, but somewhere more modern, and Mika, afraid that she won't get to tell the others about this, confesses her feelings for Yukari, her... Uh, how do you say this? Her love for Yukari, but in a platonic way. And Yukari, in a rare moment of genuineness, says that she appreciates Mika and doesn't want to forget her. They find the bridge that goes to the other side, and while they know they shouldn't cross it, it feels so tempting to do so, and then Yukari does. With Yukari gone, Mika and Chisato try and make their way back to the priest, and on the way there, they see the train from the death platform, and if it's here, then that must mean that the train is heading towards Hanashiro next, towards home. So they get on it and wait and see. And it doesn't. They somehow end up back at the church. They go and talk to the priest again and asks about Yukari, and they mention that she crossed over, and the priest says that that makes sense because she was very sensitive, and that she is the one that brought them here, and now that she is gone, the town will reject them and they will return to the world of the living, as their anchor is now gone. They, of course, want to save her, but he says that only she can save herself, and then the blinding light returns, And Chisato and Mika are now somewhere else. A teacher is scolding Chisato for her grades dropping, and the teacher is blaming it on Mika, and that confirms that they are definitely back in the real world, and they decide to go look for Yukari here, hoping that the whole thing they just experienced in the town was just a dream. But it isn't, because Yukari is walking into the sunset still in the other world, literally and figuratively. But before she can head into the great beyond, she begins to wonder where she is and where she's going and where her friends are. And her thinking about her friends makes her suddenly stop so that she doesn't enter the actual afterlife. She then recognizes where she is. She is near the school and next to her school is another school that she recognizes but can't quite place and she hears a girl and she decides to walk up to her. It's the girl from the dream, it's Chi-chan, except it's actually herself, maybe. She tries to talk to the girl, but she wanders off, and when she follows her into a room, she disappears. Yukari realizes that she's in the room they always walk through when they enter the school at night. Memories flood her mind and she remembers the time Kitamura ended things with her, in the wake of MF's suicide. And this is where things get mega ew. Yukari learns from a vision that Kitamura broke up with her because she was acting cavalier about their relationship 
and like she didn't actually care about him, so he ended things because he was hurt. Now that she knows, she regrets acting like this because she really loves him. <sighs> Stay classy, Japan. The image then thankfully fades away, and Yukari comes face to face with Chi-chan. But then Yukari's memories come back once again, and she's actually able to remember Chi-chan. Chi-chan walks off and Yukari gets another vision. It's her father and he's here to see her because he got the day off and that there is something that he wants to talk to her about. And it's about him and her mother getting a divorce. Yukari wanders around the school some more and then she gets another vision. It's her fixing her bike in the rain and then someone walks up to her and it's Kitamura. It's the story of how they met which again is ew. Yukari stumbles around some more and then another flashback. It's from when Yukari was very little and met Chisato for the first time. We learn that her parents had been fighting for a very long time before they got divorced and that Yukari from a very young age didn't want to go home and that this is probably what led her to eventually investigating the supernatural. In another vision, Yukari and her family are having their photograph taken and her mother is telling her to fix her color and Yukari is refusing and her father is telling her to do what her mother says. And then we get the flashback of how she met Mika and how this whole thing with the Twilight investigations started. Back at the school, Yukari then suddenly finds herself in the bathroom where it all began for us the player and she does the ritual and then heads towards the roof. As she walks out to the roof, the girl with the barbed hair appears and she warns her that she shouldn't have come here to the sound of sunset. She asks her what she's doing here and she says that she's not like the other people that normally come here and then she asks if she wants to go home. Yukari says yes, but that she doesn't know where that is. This journey has made her realize that she's made so many mistakes in her life because she was too stubborn and proud to just tell people how she really felt about them. Instead, she just played it cool, like she always did. Things could have been so different if she hadn't always played it cool, like she did. The girl says that a lot of people are calling for her and waiting for her to get back, and she tells her to listen for them. Yukari closes her eyes, but hears only the wailing of a child, and when she opens them, she sees Chi-chan, and she asks her if she's okay. Something seems to change, and she can see something in the distance that she can recognize. And then Mika and Chisato appear out of nowhere, and Yukari realizes that they are all going home. Some time later, they are all back at school, and the summer vacation is over. Mika is of course complaining about how short it was, and as she is, the others walk off and then she chases after them. The end. But it's actually not the end, because there is a bonus chapter, and it's even more pervy than the romance between a, an actual adult and a, an actual child. Mika is walking home from school, when a gust of wind makes her worry that someone will be able to see her underwear. And then she smells a smell and starts walking towards the direction of the smell like a Scooby-Doo character. She meets up with the others later and tells them about the smell and the gust of wind. Chisato says that it's a sign of getting sprayed with fairy dust and when Mika asks what that means, Chisato just walks off. Later we see Mika walking in the moonlight and worrying about what Chisato says before she runs into someone that she doesn't recognize but feels that she knows in a way. 
She realizes that the smell is back as she passes the stranger she just had a short interaction with. And when she turns around to see who it was, he's gone. She doesn't quite understand what is happening and feels like she's fading in and out and that something is wrong. Later at school, she walks up to Yukari and Yukari doesn't know who she is. And Mika doesn't know who Yukari is either. She sees Yukari on the street kissing Kitamura, and later Chisato running towards or away from something. And then she runs up to Mika and curses her, telling that she brought great misfortune upon them ever since she just appeared one day. Later we see Mika in front of a naked man and it's Saeki. She starts to fade away and then Saeki says something about the fairy world before it all fades to black. Now she's back in the mist world where she met Sakura and she asks why she's here and how Sakura is doing. Mika then herself says that she's exhausted and tired of pretending and sad that Yukari and Chisato are upset at her. And Sakura tells her to just kill Chisato. And then Mika repeats, kill, 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 murder, kill, eradicate. Next we see Chisato covered in blood and wondering what Mika is doing here. Mika says her house is right over there and Chisato says to her, don't worry about it. You don't need to go there anymore. They don't need you. Mika asks about the blood, but Chisato tells her to calm down and says that she did it for her and that she doesn't think that she's a bother and that her family was just in the way. She says they screamed and wept and it was all so pathetic. She says her family was filth and that they reek. Mika is paralyzed with fear and Chisato tells her that she hopes she finds happiness and then the fairy dust flies from Chisato onto Mika. Now she's opposite the strange boy, who she feels like she knows but can't quite place. He tells her that she's remembering things that didn't happen to her, but to someone else, somewhere else, another version of her. And then it feels like things restart, like Mika has been transported into another world. And she seems to realize that she has been transported into another world. It's another world where things didn't quite turn out like they did in her old world. And she then sees Yukari and Chisato, and she runs up to them. And she realizes that this is the day they met in the other world. And in this world, on this day, she decides to start their friendship back all over. And as if magic, Yukari and Chisato recognize her for now. But things will not be like they used to be. And that is the end of Kiyomo Hen. But like Tansako Hen, it is not the end of our journey and Moonlight Syndrome will pick right back up from where we left the characters just moments ago. If you're completely lost on what just happened in the epilogue, don't worry, so was I, but it will all make sense in Moonlight Syndrome. All of the scenes we just saw are from that game, and that game will provide context for mm, most of them. I don't want to give anything away, but something happened when the Syndrome gang was in the town of Dusk. Something latched onto them, not out of malice, but because it needs help. And when they exited the Dusk world, they didn't end up in the same worlds they left from, if that makes sense. And it's gonna royally fuck up their lives for a while. And when we boot up Moonlight Syndrome, things will not be as they were in Twilight Syndrome. It's a whole other world, you could say. Because it is a whole other world. I like Kiyomo Hen quite a bit more than I do Tansako Hen. You can tell that Suda was more involved this time and wasn't just trying to salvage a project. The greater emphasis on investigations that tie into the law of the universe were greatly appreciated. The town of Dusk is absolutely haunting, and I love that it's connected to so many of the other investigations like the last train from the previous game. Moonlight will be different, and I'm here for it, and I will see you when we get to that one. Take care, and good night.